All right, everybody, it's six o'clock. And I love to see how many people are joining this call. So before I pin myself and make myself the big video, look at all these people gathering for Earth Day tonight. We usually wait like a minute or two before we actually dive into the curriculum. And I would love if you wrote in the chat where you're um, tuning in from, where you're zooming in from. And if you saw anything special today on Earth Day or maybe just something that you'd like to get out of the workshop tonight, something you love about the Earth, anything you wanna share. I would love to see it in the chat. Wow, Quebec, North Carolina's Tennessee. Wild, you guys, so cool to be able to reach you all now because we started this online workshop series and I am, I am based in Florida, South Florida, and we don't necessarily have such far reach when we just teach in our place, California, Minnesota. Um, while we're starting the call as well, settling into your Zoom, um, Zoom uh, muting yourself so that way um, we don't have any background noise. New Orleans, Louisiana. <laughs> New York, Kent, Ohio, Fort Lauderdale. Oh, Kevin, welcome Kevin. Kevin and I met at Snyder Park um, the other day. I gave him some papaya seeds and he joined our call. Uh, North Carolina, awesome. So I know where you all are coming from now. How about something you love about the earth or something cool you saw today? I just saw something magnificent. I feel like I'm on a, I'm on a high from it. I was just laying down for five minutes before the call to kind of like refresh myself. And I looked out my bedroom window and there's this big beehive up in the oak tree over my home. And each day I look at it and I'm like, man, that hive's getting big. I think it's probably gonna split soon. And today the bees were swarming in an Earth Day miracle. It was so cool. They were flying around the backyard. I texted my grandma and my aunt, don't go outside right now. Um, and I took a video too that I'll, I'll post online. Did anyone else have a nice Earth Day experience today? Did you get outside? I'd love to see it. Houston, Texas, Liverpool, Virginia. Welcome everybody. So while everybody is getting acquainted in the chat, I'm holding a pamphlet right now. What is this pamphlet I'm holding? Um, our executive director, director of Heal the Planet usually starts the call, but she is very busy right now. We just did a call probably an hour or two ago for the city of Fort Lauderdale. And um, our Heal the Planet Day is this weekend. So anyone who is local, this is our biggest event. Um, this is our cool new pamphlet. It's biodegradable, which we love to see. Um, and Heal the Planet Day has all sorts of events. I'll be teaching a workshop at noon. We'll be doing like seed planting with kids, but then there's literally everything you can want to do. There's Tai Chi, there's yoga, there's food trucks, there's place to buy plants. There's anything you could want. So I will post the link right now to Heal the Planet Day in the chat for all my local friends. And we would love to see you there. Last year, I was planning Heal the Planet Day uh, in Snyder Park, which is a park that I work in. And as we know, on Earth Day last year, which was the 50 year anniversary of Earth Day, it was a very strange, well, that was a really long link. <laughs> Disregard that link. Let me send a shorter link. There we go. Second one is Heal the Planet Day. But as we know, on April 22nd of last year, it was a strange, strange world that we were in. And so Heal the Planet Day didn't happen last year, but this is our eighth annual Heal the Planet Day. It's from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and we would love to see you there. Heal the Planet is a nonprofit here in South Florida and we do all sorts of educational programming to heal the planet, but also to heal our relationship with the planet. So tonight I'm excited that you guys are here because we're gonna learn some great skills for how we can do so. So 6.05, let's dive in. Our executive director was also nice enough to give us a little more time on this call. We're always trying to like squeeze it into an hour. 
Um, but we'll go till a little before 7.30. I have a special surprise for you at the end. I know that we Zoom all the time and Zooming doesn't feel very Earth Day centric, but I hope today that um, in our time together, you have a deeper appreciation for our Earth and a, a toolkit as to how to move forward to connect more deeply with the Earth. Because, you know, a lot of us love the Earth, definitely, but it's that reciprocal relationship of feeling like we are loved back by the earth is something that is not very common these days. Um, there's kind of this story that humans inherently are here causing harm and we can't really do much good, but that's not true. Humans can definitely come into great relationship with the planet. And so tonight you're gonna to be learning some great skills around doing that specifically through food forest gardens. So let me um, pull myself up. Whoa, that's me, I'm big. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna be sharing my screen tonight. We have a couple visual things to, to pull us through this presentation. Um, in the past, this has always been a favorite class for a lot of my students in person. Um, our theme for spring for Heal the Planet, um, this is our first class, so it's going to be this one is how do we design a food forest? So we're gonna be learning design from the living world and looking towards patterns in nature to design our garden. Because a lot of times when we think about growing food, we think of straight lines, we think of boxes, we think of big agriculture, which is like lots of long rows. But the food forest is the way that nature has grown food since the beginning of time on our planet. So, um, we're going to be learning how forests come to be and how we can create those sort of systems to support ourselves, but also to support life around us. I live in a very busy urban environment. Just today, there was a car accident right on the street in front of my house. And during that call for the Earth Day call, there was a lawn blower in the background blowing leaves. And um, I definitely live in the urban environment. However, I got to see the bees swarm today and I, I saw a monarch caterpillar outside and many butterflies today, a green anole. And when you create these sort of systems, like I'm looking at right outside above my computer screen, um, you, you invite in a place to connect with the living world and remember who you are and why we're here. And then also you get to obtain the yield of food and medicine right outside your front door. So. I'll stop being a hype crew for the food forest and let's just dive into it. So I'm gonna um, introduce myself. Sorry, I, didn't, I haven't even introduced myself. <laughs> My name is Megan. Um, I'm Heal the Planet's Whole Systems Educator. I grew up here in South Florida and I definitely did not grow up on a farm with a great awareness of where my food came from, where my trash went when I threw it away. Um, and so I say all this to let you know that if I can do this, teach a Zoom workshop on Earth Day, you can do this. Um, it starts just with one thing. I see Jeff on the call right now. You, I planned an Earth Day event in the past for the city of Oakland Park and our theme was one thing because a lot of times we can get overwhelmed with how much there is to do, but it starts with one thing and I suggest the one thing is that whatever it is that excites you, whatever it is that you want to do. So if it's composting, do it. If it's starting a food forest garden, do it. Um, just start with one thing. And from there, maybe you'll be teaching a Zoom workshop next year, <laughs> who knows? So yeah, I'm Megan, nice to meet you guys. Thank you so much for being here. And now I'm going to share my screen. All right, can everybody, I, I see Jeff, Amelva, and Elizabeth. You guys are my top three I can see. Can you see the, what I'm sharing? Nice, thanks for the thumbs up, gang. Okay, so now we will play from the start. All right, dear friends, so let's dive into design tonight. Our two workshops after this will be 
how do we actually tangibly create a food forest? And then after that is how do we care for it? Once the system is started, say a pest moves in, say a hurricane rolls through, um, what do we do when things change? Because constantly things are changing. So what we're looking at right now is the cover of the permaculture design manual. Um, and what I teach is permaculture design. Permaculture, started as permanent agriculture, but it has evolved into more permanent ways of being in the world. However, I studied philosophy in school, and I'm sure many of you know nothing is permanent. We're all not going to stay here forever. Um, but there are more regenerative ways that we can go about doing things. And so I like to focus on it through the lens of gardening and growing food. Um, but there's social permaculture, financial permaculture, there's many, many um, fields. And when I describe what I do, can you guys still see me in the corner or do you only see the screen? You can see me too? You can see me. Okay, so I'm always doing this hand gesture when I describe what I do. We're trying to have this feedback loop, the, the snake that we see right here, that circular pattern, that's what we're trying to create when we're creating our systems. Somewhere along the way, we forgot that nature doesn't waste. And we started to throw things away, even though we know a way is just a place away from our house. And so what I want to inspire you guys in this workshop is aesthetically pleasing ways of harnessing that energy, maintaining that energy on your site. Okay, so what is a forest garden? It can be kind of confusing when I teach my nature tours, when I go on the nature tours, because we are uh, growing food in an actual tropical hardwood hammock forest. However, I'm going to show you a little PowerPoint at the end of this, just very briefly, of a food forest that we started in an open lot. Um, I think about a year and a half. We'll see the dates on it. But the last update, we created it last summer, um, this presentation. So you'll get to see how you can create this just on an open lot. Me, what I'm looking at right now is my front yard food forest. So whatever space you've got, what we're doing is simulating the conditions of a forest to grow food. So how does a forest work? Through succession. And so just today I was looking at, my aunt planted some peppers and there was a bunch of Spanish needle, Biden's Alba, which is one of our very common weeds that we'll see around here, but it's an amazing plant. I recently had a sinus infection and that plant was so helpful in healing me. Um, but Spanish needle, like I'm sure wherever you guys are coming from, you got that plant that's just popping up all over the place. It's a native wildflower, it's a pioneer species. And what pioneer species do is grow in the sidewalk crack. They blow in Spanish needle. The reason people don't like it is because the needles stick to your pants, um, but they're hitchhikers. And so these plants will, start to create a system. Pioneer species are amazing because they can grow out of the sidewalk crack. And we know once those pioneer species get started, a little bit of soil starts to build underneath those pioneer plants. And that creates space for larger plants to start to move in like our perennial plants and grasses, moving up to shrubs, um, then short-lived pioneer trees, those plants that aren't gonna live forever. And then finally, the succession of the forest canopy, which is what every forest is striving for. But once it reaches that point, not a lot of light is reaching the ground and those pioneer species go off to do something new. So my hope is that after this workshop today, you guys, my permaculture design teacher, she called herself a pioneer species because she would blow into towns and start some food forest systems and then once it was started, she was able to hand it off to the perennial plants and shrubs. And then things started growing from there. So Jeff on our call right here, he is definitely a perennial plant or shrub of our Urban Farming Institute uh, food forest. And Jeff, there's actually a picture of your garden later on in this too. So, so back to this slide. So that's how a forest system starts, but how we can create a forest garden is by maximizing space through stacking. And so we wanna use all these different layers here. Um, and what, the way we wanna design is from pattern to detail. So permaculture is made up of 12 principles 
And one of the principles is designing from pattern to detail. And what that means is we're going from those overarching patterns of the forest canopy. So like, what are our big trees gonna be? We wanna grow avocados. We wanna grow a mango. What is it that we wanna grow that's gonna be taking up a lot of space? And then we design down to the details. So yeah, so our canopy would be something like our mango tree. Um, then lower tree layer, I'm going to mention plants that are in the tropics, but um, if you're interested in learning plants for your place, we're going to talk about that in the next workshop, more in the details of specific plants. Um, but you can also look up as well your hardiness zone. So like where I'm located, I'm located in zone 10B. Um, and so you can look up whatever uh, California hardiness zone, wherever you are in California. California is a big state like Florida. We got a couple hardiness zones. Um, and then you can look up permaculture plants for, uh, or food forest plants for zone 10B or whatever it is. So moving down the canopy, we got our say uh, bananas, papayas, uh, shrub layer could be things like elderberry, uh, my sore raspberry. I'm getting my first raspberries this year. Maybe if you're in a more temperate place, you've got blackberries and blueberries. Um, herbaceous. So I see comfrey on here. Comfrey is a great support species. Um, that's our lower herb, kind of like hanging out in the lower understory layer in the dappled light. The rhizosphere is underground. Those are our root vegetables and root crops. For here in the tropics, that could be like cassava or yucca, sweet potato, um, radishes can help break up compacted soil. Um, then our soil surface layer, things that are right on the ground. And then climbers as well too. A fun Earth Day activity I did today was I saw a mystery bean popping up in my garden. So I made a little teepee. I like to make a little teepee for it to climb. Um, so we can maximize space through those climbers, even climbing up our canopy trees. So I always say before my nature tours that I'm going to present a lot of information tonight and I didn't say that but I am and it's just because I'm excited. Sometimes I'll even lose my voice because I get so excited <laughs> but whatever is meant to stick with you tonight will stick with you. So don't try and remember all of this. Also Heal the Planet has been great at recording these. We're recording right now um, so you can receive a copy of it. We post it on our YouTube page. Um, so don't try to remember it all, just enjoy. It's Earth Day, relax. All right, I'm trying to click, it's not happening. Okay. Whoa, did I draw a red line? Interesting. It says my internet connection is unstable. Can you still see me? My Jeff, Amelva, Elizabeth. Thanks, gang. All right, forest. So we want mainly perennial plants in our food forest system. Um, there's two words, perennial and annual. Perennial means it comes back year after year. year. Annual, think annual one. Um, those are plants that are only gonna live for one year. So perennial plants who want to self seed or just hang around like here in the tropics since we don't have a hard freeze, we can keep plants in the system for many years. We also want support species. Support species are often overlooked when we're creating a system. A lot of times we focus on productive species Productive species are fruit trees. They're all the fun, exciting stuff where it's like, yeah, avocados, mangoes, as we said before, I wanna grow all that. But then support species are really important in a system because that's what keeps us regenerative. So support species are plants that support the productive species. Support species are nitrogen fixing plants, which if we, go to the, if we go to the big box store, we order fertilizer online, it's usually a blend of NPK, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So there's certain plants that do that stuff for us. And we can have those plants in our systems to chop and drop and feed to other plants. 
We'll talk more about that in the next workshop and specific support species. But these plants are amazing. And a lot of them can feed us too. Like one of my favorite here in my place is pigeon pea. Um, if you've ever been to a Caribbean restaurant and had peas and rice, peas and rice, peas and rice are delicious. And also they fix nitrogen in the system. So nitrogen is a molecule in the air that these plants can store in their root nodes with this symbiotic relationship with a bacteria called rhizobium. This is all just big words to say, truly plant magic. And those plants will take nitrogen and feed it to other plants. And then there's like, I'm looking at Mexican sunflower right now, and that plant takes phosphorus from the soil. So it's a mineral accumulator. It takes phosphorus. We can chop it back and feed it to other plants. So support species are just as important as our productive species in order to have a um, regenerative system. We want self-renewing soils with fungi and microbial well-developed soil life. And the way that we do that is by keeping the system a forest, allowing those leaves to fall and not raking them up. Well, actually you can rake them up. We're gonna talk, talk about that in a little while. Um, but it's really important that we keep those things because if we think about the forest, that leaf that's falling to the forest floor falls there and it creates soil and the fungi feed on it and the microbial life feed on it and it creates a healthy, strong system. Uh, we want a stable, diverse ecosystem with beneficial connections throughout it and plant communities with healthy guilds. So guilds are a great way to start a food forest. Guilds are essentially a tiny food forest. Um, and we'll talk about that more in the next workshop too. I'm sorry I keep saying that, but I just gotta fit in whatever we can in this time. And also I hope you'll come to the next workshop too. <laughs> All right. These are the only word slides with a lot of boring words. I know you're looking at it and you're like, oh man. Wow, we even skipped the Y Food Forest slide. But we're about to get to the fun pictures. So we're just hitting the words in the beginning so I can sell food forest to you. Not that you aren't already sold on food forest because you're here right now. Okay, so why food forest? Uh, least amount of energy for the greatest amount of yield. So we don't have to use so much energy like we have to do with agriculture, uh, traditional agriculture, where we're growing things in straight lines, we're growing plants that don't really want to grow in our place. And it takes a lot of energy, not just from us, but from the system to keep it, keep it going. Um, doesn't need constant attention. I always say the cobbler's son goes shoeless in my own garden, um, which is just an expression to say that um, I don't spend that much time working on my garden. It takes a lot of energy to get a system started, which you'll see in the little slideshow for the Monarch Food Forest at the end. But once that energy is put in, the system starts to sustain itself. Um, wildlife, habitat, and biodiversity. This is one of my favorite reasons to have a food forest, to see those bees today Man, put me on such a high before this call. It was truly such a blessing to see and to, to see life still hanging on in the urban environment and to provide a space for the living world right outside your front door is wonderful because a lot of times we feel like we got to go to a national park or something to connect with nature, but we also forget that we ourselves are nature. Even in this little box that we're in, we are nature. But it's really wonderful to have the reminder of seeing the living world right outside your door, too. And then providing a space for them, too. Um, to work towards resilience and sustainability and um, regeneration of our communities. Maximizing space through stacking. So I have a very small, let's see if we can just turn the screen around because I'm talking about it. I have a very small front yard right here that is not really a lot of space, but... At last count, I take a count every spring. I've lived in this house. This will be my third spring. I have about, last spring I had 150 edible medicinal plants growing in this very small space. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't know who that was, but I love that that came through. Um, but yes, you can do that. So you can maximize the small space that we had and have. And this is especially important um, when we only have the space that we've got. Um, it's a long-term food solution with little upkeep. So I was on a call with a 4-H club yesterday. We do permaculture calls together and we were talking about um, food security and things like that. 
And we were saying, you know, it's interesting. We think that we have food security because we go to the grocery store, but even now in this last year, it's felt a little rocky on whether we do really have food security. Um, but then when we really look at the food at the grocery store, we see that it's either sprayed with glyphosate, which is very not good for our systems, or it's very depleted in minerals because in nutrients, because it's picked so early. And so to be able to eat a living plant right outside your door, the life force energy is unbeatable. And most of all, for me, the reason why Food Forest is a place for, you, for reunion with our living world. Um, I know for me, the times that I've felt the saddest and most lost in my life is when I feel separation from the living world. And so to have that space to reconnect at any time is a real blessing. So this is the last word slide, I swear. So good design never ceases. Keep this mantra in mind as our design workshop. We want to have an ever curious nature for how living systems evolve. We don't wanna beat ourselves up. We don't wanna say, man, I failed at that. Instead, what we wanna have is this positive, excited, curious mentality about reconnecting with the living world. And the way we can do this is by creating a little feedback loop. So we start small, we plant our little guild and we observe how it goes. And then we say, hmm, this plant's working, this plant's not working. Uh, maybe we move that plant somewhere else. Uh, maybe it's too far gone, we chop and drop, we feed it back into the system. Um, but a good feedback loop is constantly just reevaluating, rechecking things out and doing it with a sense of joy and lightness rather than being hard on ourselves. When I tell people what I do, a lot of times people say, oh, I don't have a green thumb, but green thumbs don't exist. Really the truth is, is that it's all about relationship and learning from the living world and just taking our time and being kind with ourselves through the process and enjoying the process too. That's the most important thing. And when you start to enjoy it, you start to receive some amazing gifts like seeing those bees today. And today I saw the monarch caterpillar and they're really who I am today is because of monarch caterpillars. They were initiator into me starting to notice the living world rather than just notice the world of human things that we're so constantly focused on. So I also have this theory too that certain plants like to grow for certain people. So maybe you tried growing tomatoes in the past and you failed, but maybe your plant's not tomato. Maybe it's Kevin, it's papaya for you. I gave you the papaya seeds. <laughs> Um, maybe it's not papaya for you though, but like for me, I can literally just scatter papaya seeds and it's great, but I try and grow something like ivy and it's like, no, that's not going to work for me. Um, so everybody's got their plants, you know, so you just got to learn what yours are and experiment with it and have fun with it. Or I'm taking a sip of water. Pacing myself. How's everybody doing? I can only see Jeff, Carol, and Amelva, but I hope, you're, <laughs> I hope you're having a great time. Yes, I am learning. Okay, great. Let's keep going. So what we see before us now was I worked on a site on the Big Island, and this was in our little work shed, and these are the permaculture principles. Can, I, can everyone else see that red and yellow line, or is that only me? You can see the red and yellow line? That's so weird. I don't yeah. know what I don't know what that is, but it just showed up. So let's deal with it because I'm not a Zoom expert. Um, but what we see in front of us is the permaculture principles. And if you're interested in learning more about the permaculture principles, I created my first online class. It's on my website, which I will link to at the end of this. Um, and I'm about to post it soon. So if you want to learn more, it's a great philosophy. And it's kind of our foundation for moving forward as growers. This is called the permaculture flower. So these are all just design tools that make us stronger designers. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of words here. So you don't have to kind of, I see Jeff like looking closely at the screen. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of words on here. Um, but essentially what the permaculture flower is, it's providing ways for us to expand beyond the ethics and principles through tangible practices. So 
I mentioned we're talking about it through the lens of gardening and the food forest, but it can go beyond that into finances, economics, um, building land and uh, nature stewardship, technology, education, all sorts of things. So you can just look up permaculture flower if you want to read this list a little more. Okay, so sectors. So when we're designing, we have interesting things that come into the system that will challenge us. So for me in the tropics, I would love if you guys wrote in the chat, whatever your, your challenge is, but for all my friends in South Florida, I will often get asked the question of, but what about iguanas? So iguanas are kind of like our, if you're in a temperate climate, if you've got deer, I mentioned I worked on the big island, there were giant boars that would come through and like root things up. So sectors aren't always necessarily something challenging like an iguana coming in and eating your plants. Um, it's also just, it's external uh, forces moving into your site. So this could be wind, this is sunlight patterns, this was the leaf blower, the noise, um, pollution, uh, wildlife moving through, we already mentioned, threats of fire. For me and my place, it's threat of flooding because I live in a coastal community. So sectors are things to keep in mind. When we're designing our system, two of the most important things we want to look to are wind and sunlight patterns. And so where are we at right now? We're, we're in April. So we're kind of, we had the equinox back in March. So equinox means equal day and equal night. So on the solstice, the summer solstice, which is approaching on June 21st, um, the sun will be at its northernmost point in the sky. So that's a good day to design. So what you would do is you'd go out into the space where you want to grow and take, it doesn't have to be exactly on that day, but around then you want to take photos every hour or keep a journal of where the sunlight is hitting. And then on the winter solstice, the sun will be at its southernmost point in the sky. So it's important to know this stuff so that way we can plan um, what goes where. But something I want to emphasize to you guys too is that don't get caught in the weeds with all this stuff. Just get started. Um, the most important thing is just tangible learning on the ground. When we try and like map it out and plan it all out, it keeps us stuck and it keeps us in our heads. And what we want to do is get out of our heads and into the garden and just start planting things and seeing what happens. And the way we can do this affordably, we don't wanna to have to go to the store and buy a bunch of plants is through plant pop propagation and through saving seeds. So in our next workshop, we're gonna learn how to take cuttings from other plants to grow new plants. Um, we wanna grow our system in a regenerative way as well too. And there's a lot of ways we can do that even just going to tree giveaways too, like that your city has is a great way to start a system. All right, the scale of permanence. So Yeoman was a designer. He, I believe was around even before permaculture really began back in the seventies. Um, but essentially what he created is this scale of permanence. And so what it is, is this how hard it is to change things. So at the bottom, we see soil. We're able to change soil fairly simply. When we start accumulating biomass, we start composting, we start um, stopping tilling and feeding things back into the soil. And the list ascends from there into what is the hardest to change, which is our climate, which as I was reviewing this slideshow today, I was like, man, that's a little daunting on Earth Day. Um, but it's the truth. And so what we wanna do is start small. What can we change on the ground? And one of the things we can definitely start changing is soil. And there's a lot of ways that we can create healthy soil. Our, our last couple workshops were on soil. So if you wanna review those, you can go on Heal the Planet's YouTube and watch a live stream just like this and learn about regenerative soil building. Our last one was on composting. 
So in permaculture, we also design through zones. So that's back to this mentality of least amount of energy for greatest amount of yield. So I saw my mom is on the call. And even when we were designing her kitchen, we were thinking about these zones. And what we're thinking about is like, oh, if I'm putting my spatulas here, I don't want to be, I don't want the spatulas to be on the other side of the kitchen. I want them to be right where I can use them right away. So if we're looking through zones, zones are not always concentric circles like this. They're not always just a straight as can be. And a lot of times we don't even have access to a zone five in the urban environment. Um, but let's, let's move through them and see um, what they are. So zone zero is our home, it's home base. And this can also be our self, like our internal knowledge and things like that, if we want to get philosophical about it. Um, then zone one is where we're visiting all the time. So this is like base camp. This is where we're, we're frequenting all the time. This is where we're going and picking out the herbs to garnish our meals with or the flowers to garnish our meals with. Um, it's what we, what we are around on a daily basis for the most part. Zone two is expanding out into an area with less intensive care. So this could be like an orchard where, uh, like right now we're coming into mango season in my place, but those mango trees, they're not giving us much. Actually, I learned that you can use mango leaves um, to make tea medicinally recently, which I never knew. Um, but for the most part, we're growing mangoes for the fruit and those mangoes come in in the summertime. So I don't need to be frequenting that mango tree all the time. So that would be zone two. Um, zone three is even farther away things that maybe don't fruit once a year. Maybe they fruit less like a lychee tree, which fruits every three or four years. Um, this could be grains. If you're grown, if you have a farm, this would be things like pasture animals as well too. Um, then four is a semi-wild area. So that's a place where we go into the wild and we're able to forage things like mushrooms, wild weeds, um, wild plants, things for wild crafting. And then zone five is a place that we don't even touch at all. So that's just our living classroom. It's a place that we can go to and just observe and interact. So for me, and I don't know, I'm sure a lot of you are probably in the urban environment as well too, I definitely don't have zones this concentrically, um, but I can access those zones in other ways. So like going out to the Everglades or going to a park is pretty close to a zone five. And the goal for my life is to someday have a place that I look after and I allow there to be a zone five where I don't even take from that place. It's just a place that I allow to be and to evolve. A big part of permaculture is allowing systems to demonstrate their own evolutions um, which can be challenging because we want to control things a lot, but it's a blessing to be able to just let it, let it be. Also, I know I'm breezing through, but if anybody has any questions, we're going to do some questions at the end. So feel free to write those down and we will get to it, I promise. All right, we're moving into um, different forms of design. So a watershed. So these, this is where we start to get to some really fun stuff. So branching. So what's going on in a watershed that we see before us here? We see water moving and it moves out into these branches, these tributaries that slow and spread and sink water. So the way that I would use this in my design is how can I, in a place where we are now experiencing floods more intensely than we ever have before. My grandma's house flooded three times in the last year and she's lived next door to me for the last 50 years. I haven't been here for 50 years, but um, that never happened before. Our world is changing. So we need to design our systems in a way that we are considering how we can store water in the ground rather than pitching it towards the storm drain. I think my next graphic is this one, um, which is true. So my grandma, she lives on the edge of the street. And so the water is pitched to the storm drain, but then it rained a lot in November and the storm drain was full and there was nowhere for the water to go. So it started backing up 
And then it hit her house and it started to come inside. And so there I was the next day pushing it out with a Ouija mop. And then a week later, it did the same thing. So <laughs> we have to, we have to think of these things when we're designing because the way we've designed our cities is to see water as, and sometimes there's even rules against catching rainwater. Um, so if there's rules around catching it in a rain barrel, you can still store it in the ground. And the way we can store it in the ground is through building soil, um, planting trees. Um, one blessing of these systems that we're creating throughout the urban environment is that we're creating a place to stop water. It's not an obvious yield that we're obtaining from it, but it's definitely something really important. Meanders. So naturally water wants to meander in this way. It wants to branch off. It wants to move through. It wants to slow and spread and sink itself out. So how could we use this in garden design? Um, one way that I really like to use it is through um, Adriana, if you're on the call. This was a drawing that I did recently for a client at her home down in Miami. Um, and this is the kids' food forest. And what we did was we, it's not that big of a space. It's like an urban high-shaped lot. And so we, drew, we did a design that's kind of meandering along that right side um, to make the space feel bigger. It really creates more depth when you have this kind of moving through rather than straight lines. And it also slows people down too, rather than just bolting right towards our destination, we can kind of meander through the system. Net and cracking. Wow, love to see this one with the bees today. So bees are masters of contracting the space. Like I said, I look up at that beehive and I'm like, oh my God, what are you guys doing up there? You're gonna collapse at any moment, but they know, they have, a, they have an awareness of how they can use this energy and use their space. So to the right is a way that we can maximize space through creating a different aesthetically pleasing um, garden bed and also um, harness the energy that we've got. Net and cracking is an efficient use of space. And um, that's one of the ways that we can do it if we just have a really small system. Another great way is keyhole beds too. Oh, Jeff, we're coming up on your garden. Okay, so Jeff was in my first uh, regenerative gardening in the tropics class that I taught um, at the Urban Farming Institute. And he created a circular garden based off of this this class that we taught. And so circular gardens are another way that we can design that contains energy. It holds the energy in and focuses it. And also it just looks really cool too. Um, it's just a different, interesting way of growing things. Um, when we expand the way we grow, you'll see in the, in the presentation I'm gonna show you at the end, we designed our garden in the shape of a shamrock because it was for a 4-H club. So. Think outside the box, as they say, because a box is often how we think of growing. Uh, there's Jeff's garden. <laughs> it was years ago. Um, he's definitely come a long way since then, but this is when he first designed it. And he created this kind of circular shape with some cruciferous vegetables, it looks like he's got, some cranberry hibiscus, some banana, and even some circular planters with looks like tomatoes in there. And that was another just big design here. Okay, so spirals. Spirals are a shape that we'll see a lot in nature. Um, on the left was a fern that I saw in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. It was one of those giant tree ferns when I worked on that site on the Big Island. And then to the right is a way that we could use that spiral shape. So, Spirals use torque to move energy and they hold that strength. Think about that fern unfurling. And the reason we would create an herb spiral is because an herb spiral creates these different microclimates to use our space effectively. So at the top of the herb spiral, obviously it would be a little bit drier up there. So we would plant plants that would like things a little bit drier, like say rosemary. Um, 
And then at the bottom, we could plant more water loving plants like mint. We're creating these different microclimates to grow. An overback jet is just another really cool one. This is like the shape of a mushroom. So what an overback jet is when a certain energy, when energy hits a certain point, like think about a river where the river eddies out, that's where that energy spirals out. So um, different ways we could use this is like this cool fountain right here that's moving some water, wind breaks, keyhole beds, um, just another cool design. All right. And we're getting to the most important pattern now. So what's going on here? Whoa, these are some weird shapes. Let's just look at the tree at the top. So I mentioned before that I, I was listening to the sound of a leaf blower earlier and I pretty much grew up to the sound of leaf blowers here in the urban environment because we love to get rid of leaves as they fall. So if you only remember one pattern tonight from our workshop, I hope you remember the mother pattern. So the mother pattern or the general model as it's known as it is in permaculture is how life functions. It's the leaf falling from the tree, feeding back into the root system of the tree, those nutrients being absorbed, brought back up into the tree and that system continues on. So somewhere along the way, we forgot this pattern but on Earth Day, I hope to remind you that there is no waste in the living world. And it's important that we start to cycle these nutrients back into the system, because if we continue to blow them up and get rid of them and mix them with our waste when they're sent off to the landfill, we're missing out on that resource and we are doing ourselves a disservice. We're doing the living world a disservice. So mother pattern, an important one. Keep it in mind. This is the tree of life in New Orleans. I have my mom from New Orleans on the call. Um, and this is a very special tree, but maybe you have a tree like this in your place. I live beneath some oak trees here. That's where that, that beehive was up in. Um, not, not as big as this oak tree though, but maybe you've got one, a tree that you love. You're welcome to share that in the chat if you'd like. All right, so here's just a little drawing of a design. This was one from the past, but starting to bring in some of those different shapes. Um, but now I'm gonna show you the Monarch presentation real quick, but let's take a breath for a moment because I've just been go, go, going. Maybe, maybe some questions too. Does anybody have any questions? I'm gonna look at the chat real quick. Oh, iguanas. <laughs> What is the next workshop you keep referring to? Our next workshop is on May 19th. So it's usually every third Wednesday, actually all day yesterday, I thought it was Earth Day and I thought our workshop was yesterday, <laughs> but we did it specially on Earth Day. So it's on a Thursday, but we're usually on the third Wednesday of the month. I uh, never thought of a spiral planter, love it. Thank you, Garrett, for sharing New River Gardens. Um, terrace gardening is similar, eco-friendly. Yes, terrace gardening is miraculous. Um, not to use the green waste bin. Good question, Kevin. So here in Fort Lauderdale, we have something called a green waste bin. Um, and the only time I really use the green waste bin is if like I have white flies. Like the other day I was bringing, cutting off some banana leaves and I noticed there was white flies underneath. There's something you can do called solarization where you put a tarp over your um, diseased plant matter and the sun will kill it. You can also have a fire with those plants to get rid of it. Um, but because I'm in the urban environment, I have a small space. I don't have that access to that right now. Um, so I'll use it very sparingly in that case. But for the most part, healthy plants, we wanna just cut back and keep in the system. Wondering how long to wait for a comeback after a freeze. Um, good question. Uh, because I don't live in a place where there's freezes, I'm not an expert on freezes, um, but I think it just goes based off however long you wanna wait. I know sometimes it can be uncomfortable to sit with plants that look like they're dead, 
or maybe some of my friends in the temperate region, you could respond in the chat to how long it usually takes for plants to bounce back if they got burned in a freeze. Is leaf burning illegal, is leaf burning legal here? Um, not exactly sure. Uh, you can have fires and things like that, so you could do it in that case. Um, but I also know that sometimes it can be challenging in the urban environment with neighbors and things like that. All right, let's get to the Monarch presentation. So now to give you guys a little excitement and hope of a food forest garden that has already begun. Okay, so can everybody still see me? Screen share, there we go. All right, everybody sees the presentation now. Jeff, Carol, and Amelva, thumbs up. Okay, here's slideshow. All right, so the Monarch Food Forest was created by the Monarch 4-H Club. And, whoa, that just changed on its own. Um, but 4-H is a great program for kids in the community to learn all sorts of different skills that they don't necessarily learn in school. And so we focused on gardening in this project. So in November 2019, I didn't have a before picture of just the lot, but what we started to do was we started to have mulch dropped by tree trimmers, local tree trimmers. So when you hear those chippers and you hear those weed whackers, um, a lot of times these tree trimmers, they have to pay to drop their organic matter off at the landfill. So one way that you can create a regenerative relationship in your community and save money on mulch and save plastic um, is by having local mulch dropped off at your site. So you can see there's like a variety of different mulches here. At Monarch, we just had a big load of bamboo mulch dropped, but usually what we want to ask for is a clean load of hardwood mulch, which could be in my place things like oak trees, mahogany, uh, royal poinciana. When these plants are pruned back, um, they provide a great mulch. And if we think about it, based off of our mother pattern, that is perfectly broken down organic matter on the forest floor because it's been sent through the chipper. So it's like we accelerated time and we got those nutrients right away. And it's great for suppressing weeds. It's great for storing water. Um, and it feeds our plants at the same time too. It's a big dose of carbon. I learned that the mulches provide different things like the bamboo I learned provides silica, which is a really great nutrient for the soil. Royal poinciana is a nitrogen fixer. That's a royal poinciana overhead in this shot. So what happened next? August, I can't see, I think it's August 2020, there we go. August 2020, so this was November, so that was just a couple months later. Um, so how did we go from this to, from that to this? Let's find out. Oh, it's another question about why food forest, but we already talked about this. Um, but maybe there's some other ones on here that pique your interest. I'm very interested in community food forest gardens like this, where neighbors can come and learn and exchange resources. I work in one of our city parks too. And um, I think it would be wonderful if we had more places like this where you could come get cuttings of certain plants and bring them back to your garden. Um, or we can come and share in the harvest together and use these open lots more effectively. So there's a bunch of different things to kind of pique your interest on here. I won't go through them all. Um, so yeah, we began in the backyard. We did sheet mulching. So this is a great way to build garden beds. You'll learn about the specifics of this in one of our soil workshops from the past. Um, but you can see we created a little shamrock, a mini shamrock here in the back. Um, and we did it through sheet mulching with cardboard and just using bricks that we found and mulch and compost. Uh, local mulch, here I am hyping it up again. Free resource that builds soil on our sandy limestone bedrock. So then we expanded out into the open lot next door. So this is what you saw in the beginning. 
Um, so this is just a neighboring lot next to the 4-H club. And you can see it was just kind of overgrown with plants here. And so what we did to first suppress those plants, rather than digging things up, tilling the ground, we just started to lay down mulch because we knew that we weren't building a lot of soil there. It was just ground being mowed over and over again. And so we just started laying down mulch and the one thing led to another and we started building soil and creating a hospitable place to plant. So yeah, the foundation is the soil. So um, that's Leanne right there on the left. She's the head of the 4-H club. And so we laid down our mulch and then we started to lay out our space for the garden too. Um, and we decided we wanted to do the trail in the shape of the of the 4-H clover. So we had that kind of meandering shape once again um, to move through the food forest. So you can kind of see the shape here. We laid it out with coconut husks because our beekeeper, Keith, he has a side job where he slings coconuts. He gives out coconut water. So we have an excess of coconut shells. Um, so get creative with whatever excess you have around. Um, maybe it's logs. Maybe it's like in on the big island where I work, we had an excess of lava rock. So we would use that. Um, whatever it is that you've got, you can use that to create and delineate the space. And then you can see we started to plant our our big trees. So in the front, that's a little soursop tree, which is much bigger now, a lang lang there on the left, which can get 40 feet tall. So we started to lay our, our pattern to detail like we were talking about. Um, and we also planted our support species as well too. One of our primary support species is cassia, which I believe we have a photo in. Yes, so that's cassia right there on the right, that yellow plant. That's my friend Makita on the right. Um, and she actually taught me, I remember her saying, she said, there's medicine in cassia. And there is, I always thought the medicine was in the nitrogen, but also cassia is a really amazing plant for the body too. Um, so it is candle bush, because it has those beautiful flowers that kind of look like a candle stick. And then some other great plants coming in, like in the center is callaloo, which is a wonderful green that just, you can't stop growing it. It grows, it's in the amaranth family, those seed heads spread all over the place. Um, and then some blue basil on the left, which our bees love. We had some bananas we planted along the back edge. So this was August, 2020. Um, we've already received like three or four racks from these bananas now. It's kind of cool to be looking at this now. Um, on the left, those are some of the 4-H club members just planting trees from the tree giveaway. I think they're planting jabotacaba in that, which is like a very rare tropical fruit that we got free from the city because they were just giving them away. There's our beekeeper, Keith. Um, and so then, as we know, it was a blessing because we didn't know that this time last year, everything would be so different. But we started the system back in November before... March of 2020 and we planted a cover crop of seminal pumpkins and so I at this time was actually down in the Keys which is where my dad lives um, kind of just hunkered down teaching online too and um, not tending to this garden and so the seminal pumpkins spread over the ground and when I came back we had a huge harvest of seminal pumpkins which was pretty great it suppressed weeds um, and started to build soil in the system as well. There's Leanne on the right, I just love her. Um, so here's the backyard. This is a watermelon that just popped up out of nowhere. Um, we had some mystery, we've started another food forest since this one called the Itala Food Forest, named after one of our um, native butterflies here. And just today on that Fort Lauderdale call, I was holding up like pumpkins and sweet potatoes and a butternut squash. And I was realizing all of this was stuff I didn't even plant intentionally. When we just provide a, a place for nature to grow rather than just thinking we got to mow the grass over and over again, it's amazing what pops up and what comes to be. And that's Lawrence. And he's like, whoa, there's a watermelon. Cause he was the one who first spotted it, which was crazy. We all shared it together. Uh, this was just something we did last year 
um, during the pandemic, we handed out cuttings from the garden. We distributed them to a local high school. That's Mr. Newman. He um, is the local science teacher. And so we did something we made up called the Summer of Growing, where we handed out pineapple tops I can see in here and soil and different cuttings that the plants suggest that the they got a list of plants that they wanted to learn how to grow. And they all started their own little backyard gardens over the summer, which was great. And we just used cuttings specifically from the food forest. So yeah, there it is, the Monarch Food Forest. And it's even better now, just a year later, um, we're about to film a tour of it that will be um, online soon that I'll share with you guys. But here's something to just provide a little hope to you all that it's possible and it can be done in a very short time using very few resources and with fun and love and connection and um, just excitement. So I hope that feels good to you guys. Uh, let me get on out of here. All right, so I'm gonna come back to the chat now, see what's going on in the questions. Mulches help to protect against freezing and rhododendrons definitely make a comeback even when they look awful. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for sharing that. Um, love to mulch. Mulch is always such a useful thing. Um, burning of waste is prohibitive with city limits in most places. Call the city and check in your area. So yeah, sometimes it is prohibited. Um, so that would be a, a chance that we could use, Kevin, like you were asking, that would be an opportunity to use the green bin should you feel that you, um, you need to. But for the most part, if it's a healthy plant, we wanna keep it in the system. We wanna chop and drop it back. Um, Heal the Planet said, yes. <laughs> I'm wondering if that's Noelia. Noelia, have you joined our call? Yes, I have. Awesome. Well, I'm going to pause for a moment before our little surprise at the end. So do you want to share a little bit about Heal the Planet and Heal the Planet Day? Yes, of course. So I'm Noelia. I work with Heal the Planet and I work with Megan. So we have our biggest event coming up. Uh, can you see me? I, I only see. Can you see me, Megan? Yes, I pinned okay, your video. Great. Okay, great. So we have our biggest event coming up on Sunday. If you are in Florida and you want to be part of a big event for children and for adults, uh, please join us on Sunday at Esplanade Park. That is right by the Museum of Discovery and Science. It's a free event but we require registration. So if you register in advance, it will be an easier step uh, when you get there. We have all kinds of activities for adults and for kids from yoga, meditation, Tai Chi. Uh, we're gonna do karate. We're gonna do some, uh, all kinds of things, including activities for kids, about 20 activities. So this is Sunday. It's a day to enjoy yourself, go outdoors. And I think it will be great if you can join us. If you are able to register before um, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's a deadline to win $150 or $250 just by registering. You have to be there at 1 p.m. to get your price. Um, and after that, then we have to stop, you know, putting together the list for, for the cash price, but you can still register afterwards. Um, we're gonna have food trucks. We're gonna have food vendors. We're gonna have all kinds, of, you know, like nonprofits are gonna be joining us and they're gonna be presenting their, their nonprofits and it's gonna be like for everyone. So even if you're a teenager, if you are, um, you know, older on, on, you know, any time and you want to be there. So we're gonna start at 10 and I hope you can make it. We're gonna send you the link. I think um, Megan already put it here. Oh, 
So this is a QR code. Uh, let me see if it, if, um, if not, I'll send you the link because it's a little, yeah, that QR code is working. If you want to register, you can do that. And if not, I can quickly send you the link um, to our event. I hope you can join us. You really like it. And again, it's free. You're going to be learning about, you know, a lot of things like Megan was teaching you today. Um, so I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you, Megan. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Noelia. Can you see I shared I shared my screen. I was trying to share the flyer. Yeah, you did. You shared it. I shared it. OK. Yeah. And if you want to have, if you want to get more information, you can go to healtheplanet.com. And then we have on the menu, Heal the Planet Day. And you can there see all the details. You see? Yep. Yeah, so into our slideshow. So um, there's Heal the Planet's website. If you follow us on social media, um, we're Heal the Planet on Instagram and on Facebook. We also have a pretty great newsletter. Most newsletters are not very fun, but Heal the Planet's newsletter is pretty fun because it's just like interesting things to know about and it's not that frequent in your mailbox. Um, and then if you wanted to see another food forest garden tour, I posted, I just launched my new website last month. And so um, there's a food forest garden tour of my front yard food forest on there. So if you go to newrivergardens.com, you can see that. Um, and then I'm gonna post a video of the bees on my Instagram after this. So if you wanna be friends on Instagram, I try and share educational content on there as much as I can. Um, social media is hard as we all know, but social media also brought a lot of us together today, which is a blessing. So with that, um, here I am with a guitar. <laughs> so last Heal the Planet Day, we did this whole online thing where we had a bunch of different videos throughout the day. And um, Noelia asked me, or I think it was Ken, he asked me, uh, Ken is our founder, what, what I should do. And I was going to do a quick video on Food Forest, but I thought it would be a little bit more impactful if I sang a song. And it was my first time singing a song and sharing it online. Um, but I want to share it for you guys today. It's a song written by Jackson Brown. And as we get towards the end of the day, well, it's almost sundown here. We've all been looking at our screen. So you don't have to. I'm going to unpin my video too. So that way we can see everybody here too. Um, and just be together, or you can just kind of put your screen down and kind of look outside and just take a moment here on Earth Day, this special day that helps us to remember who we are and why we're here and just listen to this song and kind of relax and breathe. Let's all just take a breath together for a moment, maybe closing your eyes. It's how we start our nature tour, breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth, maybe taking another one of these, just letting go of all of those pressures of the human world and remembering who we are and um, that we are the earth. So here it is, it's called Before the Deluge. It's written by Jackson Brown. Some of them were dreamers, and some of them were fools who were making plans and thinking of the future. And with the energy of the innocent, they were gathering the tools they would need to make their journey back to nature. And while the sand slipped through the opening and their hands reached for the golden ring, 
With their hearts, they turn to each other's hearts for refuge. Troubled years that came before the deluge. Some of them knew pleasure. Some of them knew pain. And for some of them, it was only and on the brave and crazy wings of you, they went flying around in the rain, and their feathers, once so fine, grew torn and tattered. And in the end, they traded their tired wings for the resignation the living brings. And exchange love's bright and fragile glow for the glitter and the rouge. And in a moment they were swept before the deluge. Now let the music keep our spirits high. Now let the buildings keep our children dry. That creation reveal its secrets by and by. By and by. And the light that's lost within us reaches the sky. Some of them were angry at the way the earth was abused by the men. Forge her beauty into power. They struggle to protect the world, only to be confused by the magnitude of the feeling in the final hour. And when the sand was gone and the tunnel dry, and the naked dawn only a few survived. So simple and so huge. Believe that they were meant to be after the deluge. Let the music keep our spirits high. Let the buildings keep our children dry. That creation revealed secrets by and by. By and by. When the light that's lost within us reaches the sky. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. A muted applause. <laughs> Well, happy Earth Day, everybody. I'm sending you all so much love and I'm so grateful to be here tonight sharing with you all. So I would love to connect with you all once again. I'm gonna share my website online, joinhealtheplanet.com. My Instagram is New River Gardens. And I hope you go out and enjoy that beautiful sunset. It's a blessing now to be able to have some natural light on these calls and um, enjoy the rest of this day. And as they say, every day is Earth Day and it really is the truth, especially when you create these sort of systems in wherever you are. So if anybody's got any more questions, I'll stand by for the next couple of minutes in the chat. Thank you all. Um, and until next time, go out and look at that moon. Yeah, go out and look at that moon. What was the name of that song? Before the Deluge. By Jackson Brown.
All right, everybody. Are these presentations on YouTube? Yes. So I can link, I'll link to Heal the Planets. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for being here. You were one of my, my helpers <laughs> for helping me to see if... Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Where are you, where are you calling in from? Uh, El Cajon, California. Wow, that's great. So how did you hear about our workshop tonight? Um, I saw it on, um, I get uh, information as far as, you know, presentations that are coming up. And um, I'm also taking horticulture classes at uh, a local college. And this fits right in with, with what uh, we're talking about. Wow, that's great. I like the uh, garden designs. Awesome. All right, I'm sending the link right now to Heal the Planet's YouTube page. And I believe there's a channel for these. Yeah, so it's under permaculture. Um, and we've had three workshops so far that have been recorded online. And they're, they're focusing a lot on um, soil. I see the first one was Intro to Permaculture. So um, learning about permaculture and things like that. I am taking a soils class right now. So it's very interesting. That's wonderful. You know, a lot of times when we think of gardening, we think of plants, um, the, the fun stuff, but the fun stuff is really in the soil. And I think of one of my bosses, he'd always say, we don't feed the plants here. And then he'd pause and then he'd say, we feed the soil. And it's the truth, you know, that's, that's where the, the nutrients are absorbed. It's the most important part, according to my instructor. Definitely. So Kai has a question. What is the difference between using regular soil versus organic soil if you buy at the nursery? So Kai, excellent question. Um, regular soil versus organic soil. A lot of times when we buy soil in the bags too, they're not very full of nutrients, but I would recommend buying the organic soil because the regular soil can have, um, but it's really hard to even delineate between those things now because glyphosate is so um, present in our systems it's water soluble so it's like absorbed by everything it's there's even my organic garden where I don't spray it, it comes through the rain um, but organic soil would be a lot more nutrient dense hopefully you would look for things like mycorrhizal life bacteria fungi manure things like that would be a good blend to focus on Thank you for your joy and energy, Rebecca. I don't know if she's still here. <laughs> she is, Rebecca, I see you. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, does anybody else have any more questions? Comments? This should be online in a couple of days. Bakwano, yeah, Bakwano is great. Bat poo. <laughs> All right, you guys, I'm gonna end the call now. So love to all and I will, next call is May 19th if you'd like to be there for the uh, same, so you can log on to Heal the Planets or on New River Gardens, I have the link for the Zoom as well too. Um, May 19th, third Wednesday. Thanks you guys. Awesome as always, thank you, Megan. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day.